Hi everyone, uh, we're going to read Chapter 5 of Wind in the Willows. Um, if you remember, Ratty and Mole and Otter had just left Mr Badger and were making their way home. The sheep ran huddling together against the hurdles, blowing out thin nostrils and stamping with delicate forefeet, their heads thrown back and a light steam rising from the crowded sheep pen into the frosty air as the two animals hastened by in high spirits with much chatter and laughter. They are returning cross country after a long day's outing with the Otter, hunting and exploring on the wide uplands where certain streams tributary to their own river had their first small beginnings and the shades of the short winter day were closing in on them and they had still some distance to go. Plodding at random across the plough they had heard the sheep and had made for them and now leading from the sheep pen they found a beaten track that made, a wa that made walking a lighter business and responded moreover to that small inquiring something which all animals carry inside them saying unmistakably, yes, quite right, this leads home. If it looks as though we're coming to a village, said the mole somewhat dubiously, slackening his pace as the track that had in time become a path and then had developed into a lane, now handed them over to the charge of a well-metalled road. The animals did not hold with villagers, and their own highways, thickly frequented as they were, took an ind independent course, regardless of church, post office or public house. Oh, never mind, said the rat. At this season of the year, they're all safe indoors by this time, sitting round the fire. Men, women, children, dogs and cats and all. We shall slip through all right, without any bother or unpleasantness, and we can have a look at them through their windows, if you like, and see what they're doing. The rapid nightfall of mid-December had quite beset the little village as they approached it on soft feet over a first thin fall of powdery snow. Little was visible but squares of dusky orange-red on either side of the street, where the firelight or lamplight of each cottage overflowed through the casements into the dark world without. Most of the low lattice windows were innocent of blinds, and to the lookers-in from outside, the inmates gathered round the table, absorbed in their handiwork, or talking with laughter and gesture, had each the happy grace which is the last thing the skilled actor shall capture, the natural grace which goes with the perfect unconsciousness of observation. Moving at will from one theatre to another, the two spectators, so far from home themselves, had something of a wistfulness in their eyes as they watched a cat being stroked, a sleepy child picked up and huddled off to bed, or a tired man stretch and knock out his pipe on the end of a smouldering log. But it was from one little window, with its blind drawn down, a mere blank transparency on the night, that the sense of home and the little curtained walls within walls the larger stressful world of outside nature shut out and forgotten most pulsated. Close against the white blind hung a birdcage, clearly silhouetted, every wire, perch and appurtenance distinct and recognisable, even to yesterday's dull-edged lump of sugar. On the middle perch the fluffy occupant, head tucked well into its feathers, seemed so near to them as to be easily stroked had they tried, even the delicate tips of his plumped out plumage penciled plainly on the illuminated screen. As they looked, the little sleepy fellow stirred uneasily, woke, shook himself and raised his head. They could see the gape of his tiny beak as he yawned in a bored sort of way, looked round, then settled his head into his back again, while the ruffled feathers gradually subsided into perfect stillness. Then a gust of bitter wind took them in the back of the neck, a small sting of frozen sleet on the skin woke them as if from a dream, and they knew their toes to be cold and their legs tired, and their own home distant a weary way. Once beyond the village where the cottages ceased abruptly on either side of the road they could smell through the darkness the friendly fields again. They braced themselves for the last long stretch, the home stretch, the stretch we know is bound to end. Sometime in the rattle of door latch, the sun firelight and the sight of familiar things greeting us as long absent travellers from far over sea. They plodded along steadily and silently, each of them thinking his own thoughts. The moles ran a good deal on supper, as it was pitch dark, and it was all a strange country to him as far as he knew, and he was falling obediently in the wake of the rat, leaving the guidance entirely to him. As for the rat, he was walking a little way ahead, as his habit was, his shoulders hummed, his eyes fixed on the straight grey road in front of him, so he did not notice the poor mole when suddenly the summons reached him and took him like an electric shock. We others, who have long lost the subtle 
of the physical senses have not even the proper terms to express an animal's intercommunications with his surroundings, living or otherwise, and have only the word smell, for instance, to include the whole range of delicate thrills which murmur in the nose of, an, of the animal night and day, summoning, warning, inciting, repelling. It was one of these mysterious fairy calls from the outer the void that suddenly reached Mole in the darkness, making him tingle through and through with his very familiar appeal. Even while yet even while yet he could not clearly remember what it was, he stopped dead in his tracks, his nose searching hither and thither in efforts to recapture the fine filament, the telegraphic current that had so strongly moved him. A mo a moment and he had caught a moment and he caught it again, and with it this time came the recollection in fullest flood. Home. That's what they meant, those caressing appeals, those soft touches wafted through the air, those invisible little hands pulling and tugging all one way. Why, it must be quite close by him at that moment, his old home, that he'd hurriedly forsaken and never sought again, that day when he first found the river, and now it was sending out his scouts and his messengers to capture him and bring him in. Since his escape on that bright morning, he'd hardly given it a thought, so absorbed he'd been in his new life, in all its pleasures, its surprises, its fresh and captivating experiences. Now, with a rush of old memories, how clearly it stood up before him in the darkness. Shabby indeed, and small and poorly furnished, and yet his, the home he had made for himself, the home he had been happy to get back to after his day's work, and the home he had been happy with him to, the home that had been happy with him too, evidently, and was missing him and wanted him back, was telling him so through his nose, sorrowfully, reproachfully, but with no bitterness or anger, only with the plaintive reminder that it was there and wanted him. The call was clear, the summons was plain, he must obey it instantly and go. Ratty called, full of joyful excitement, Hold on, come back, I want you quick. Oh, come along, Muldoo, replied the rat cheerfully, still plodding along. Please stop, Ratty, pleaded the poor Mole, in anguish of heart. You don't understand. It's my home, my old home. I've just come across the smell of it, and it's close by here, really quite close. And I must go to it. I must, I must. Oh, come back, Ratty. Please, please come back. The Rat was by this time very far ahead, too far to hear clearly what the Mole was calling, too far to catch the sharp note of painful appeal in his voice. And he was much taken up with the weather, for he too could smell something, something suspiciously like approaching snow. Mole, we mustn't stop now, really, he called back. We'll come for it tomorrow, whatever it is you found. But I daren't stop now, it's late, and the snow's coming on again. And I'm not sure of the way, and I want your nose, Mole, so come on quick. There's a good fellow. And the rat pressed forward on his way without waiting for the answer. Waiting for an answer. Poor Mole stood alone in the road, his heart torn asunder, and a big sob gathering, gathering somewhere low down inside him, to leap up to the surface presently he knew in a passionate escape. But even under such a test as this his loyalty to his friend stood firm. Never for a moment did he dream of abandoning him. Meanwhile the wasps from his old home pleaded, whispered, conjured and finally claimed him imperiously. He dared not tarry longer with their magic circle. With a wrench that tore his very heartstrings he set his face down the road and followed submissive, submissively in the track of the rat while faintly thin little little smells still dogging his retreating nose reproached him for his new friendship and his callous forgetfulness. Right guys, we'll leave it here and we'll pick up part two of chapter five next. Um, hopefully everyone's okay. Keep safe, keep happy and keep reading. And I'll speak to you soon.